I work at a company uh, in Boulder called Slend Data. We do uh, analytics for NoSQL stores, but from my perspective, it's basically a compiler company. Um, we, I basically work, and as, along with others, but from my perspective, I compile from a uh, multi-dimensional relational model to NoSQL store query languages or whatever you, APIs. Um, and so this talk kind of describes how we do that using um, some type level stuff and some hopefully future type level stuff. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so um, it's not compiler specific. Uh, a lot of this stuff in here, uh, if you're not interested in compilers, uh, works anytime you're dealing with recursive data types, things like that. Um, from my perspective, again, I do a lot of it with compilers, so that's kind of how I'm presenting it here. A compiler is actually a pretty simple thing. There's like three big pieces. You parse something, you do all the compiling, and then you write it out somewhere. Um, things like Unison, get rid of that parser, right? The, if you have a structure editor or something like that, the parser basically becomes nothing. Uh, if you have an interpreter, that's actually still a compiler. Um, it's just the serializer is an evaluator instead. Uh, but you're still actually doing lots of compiling. Python people don't really like it when I say that, but they, they do a lot of compiling. Um, so anyway, the, and the compiler is pretty generic. I mean, it's basically that compiler is a function from A to B. It's a little bit more specific than that, but really the like, data transformation in general, that's you know, what a compiler is. You do it all the time in all your programs. It's not compiler specific. Um, but since we're talking about compilers, we're going to be talking about the language uh, that we compile. Um, and oh, also through this talk, there's a few things that have been alighted for space and clarity. I hope clarity. Um, so don't expect that all this just compiles the way it looks. Some things have been fudged a little bit. Um, but anyway, this is our, our sort of lambda calculus. Um, it's, uh, so lambda calculus, um, you know, you have lambdas, you have uh, applications, and you have variables. Uh, in this case, it's uh, multi-parameter uh, lambdas and applications. Um, and, uh, and then we also have in it a, a let, let bindings and, you know, some conditional test structure. Uh, so this is the basic language that we'll be compiling from uh, in, this, in this talk. And of course, you have to compile to something, uh, but we don't really care what that is. Uh, some assembler and uh, and just kind of avoid the details of that. Um, unfortunately, this didn't syntax highlight for some reason. That wasn't intentional to make it more confusing, but um, <laughs> but I don't know. I, I couldn't figure out how to make this one block uh, syntax highlight. So uh, this is sort of the uh, this is a very common way of writing compilers. Um, I worked on compilers in a few companies and on a few different projects. Uh, and this is a very common way to do it, where you basically try to do as much as possible uh, in as little code and as little, you know, taking as little time as possible. So you do everything in like in one pass. You're like, oh, I have the data here. I'm going to do a whole bunch of things to it all at once, and then I have like the thing that I'm trying to get to. It's not always one pass. Sometimes there's, you know, you have multiple things chained, but you try to have it as minimal as possible. Uh, and so in this monolithic thing, we basically uh, are doing a bottom-up uh, compilation where you have recursive calls to compile. Right on all of the. Um, let me. I'll just go back actually for a second to this language, so you can see in here. You know, like there's the recursive bits are more lambda expressions. Uh, lambda is the language. Um, uh, so for the uh, for lambda, the lambdas themselves, the functions, the bodies of lambda. For an application, both the function and the expression, the list of expressions you're applying uh, to are um, are recursive. You know, recursive. So you have this recursive uh, lambda structure uh, through this. So anyway, in here, um, all those recursive parts, you're making recursive calls. Uh, in the case of, um, say, the app, you, know, you end up traversing over your sub-expressions, compiling those. Uh, and again, the, the, result, the result of this is, is um, with some state, because you need some state to figure out the details of what binding to what and, and things like that. So um, you know, this is actually you know, this is a super simple compiler. Uh, I have you know, triple qu question marked um, large chunks of it. Um, but uh, um, but this is really simple, and the problems that you run into with this kind of thing, just you know, imagine bigger things and how things don't necessarily scale, scale linearly. So here might not look too problematic, um, but as you get bigger programs and bigger compilers for real languages, uh, they become a lot more programmat or problematic. So anyway, this is this is a very common way to write a compiler. Uh, everything at once. A another fairly common way to write a compiler uh, is called micropass or multipass. We try to break things down into stages. Oh, we're going to do this kind of thing first. We're going to do you know some other thing and some other thing, um, which has a performance cost. You end up you know oh, okay, we'll do this transformation over the data, but it, it but it improves clarity. You end up um, having you know each stage is simpler. You can modify it. Uh, you find this more often in say university courses. Uh, in my experience, I've written uh, 
the monolithic style um, for compilers that have customers and, uh, or users, um, and uh, the micropass style for uh, DARPA. And that is, uh, <laughs> that's the <laughs> distinction there. Um, but it's much nicer. I mean, I, you know, this is a much nicer way to write a compiler. Um, so when you have the freedom to and you don't care about, like, oh, we have to squeeze out every ounce of performance, you try doing this approach. Um, so there's, there's two versions of micropass, and you actually kind of usually end up somewhere in between in, in various parts of your code, uh, the unsafe version and the version that has a lot of code duplication. Um, so the unsafe version, you have, say, an initial pass, uh, something like this desugaring, uh, which is a very common name as well, uh, where you take certain constructs of your language and, uh, and reduce them into other constructs, basically eliminating things that are, you know, uh, can be duplicated with other, with other parts of your language. Uh, in this case, you know, we take the, uh, the let bindings um, and turn those into you know, uh, lambdas with applications, and the if, uh, a test in the lambda calculus is basically a function that returns a function, um, but it's basically a two-parameter function uh, for the true and false cases. So that uh, desugar that desugars to um, an application with two arguments, uh, the true and the false cases. Uh, and so basically now what you've done uh, after this desugaring um, is you now have a, basically three components in your lambda, right? You no longer have any lets. You no longer have any ifs. You only have lambdas, applications, and variables. Um, and so you, know, you now have, so you now have the simpler thing, and this is great. Now you only have to worry about those three cases in any kind of processing you're doing on this new structure. So you have a simpler structure. Uh, however, um, you don't have a new AST. So you, know, you can now do this compilation. You're basically your translation, which is the, the second half of that compilation step. Um, you, have, you handle your three cases, but then you still have lets and um, uh, lets and ifs in your AST. So you know you sys error or you expose that through a disjunction or or whatever. But somehow you know these this impossible case you still have to account for somewhere. And of course, using this kind of catch-all, you can possibly miss one of your non-catch-all uh, cases and you know run into bad bad compilation. So anyway, this is the unsafe version. This is where you basically like. We have this AST, we're going to be doing things to it, but we still have the one AST and we just like, keep using it over and over. Uh, and that, you know, that original compilation from there is now just a composition of these two. Uh, from the, sorry, the original compile from the monolithic one is now just done as a composition of these two operations. Um, and so you've traversed, and again, you've traversed your structure twice, um, so you end up, you know, you spend more time in, in compilation. Uh, so the other approach uh, with the, uh, with the, um, Micropass system is uh, is to duplicate your structures. In this, we've now taken a subset of our lambda uh, and made a new AST that has only the components we'll have after desugaring, right? So now, when we do the desugaring, it compiles from lambda to the inner lambda structure. So we have a new AST that now you know. So now we can be basically say like we know we only have these cases, but now you've duplicated basically the majority of your um, of your one AST, and uh, and also you don't want to like. You don't want to do this too much, right? So you, as, as a programmer writing this code, um, like you don't want to, if you decompose your steps a lot, you would end up with a ton of very minimally different ASTs along the way, and you have now all this duplicated code. Um, and it, you also, if you make a change to one of those ASTs, any of the other ASTs that overlap with that, you have to change those as well to so end up with a kind of a maintainability problem there. Um, but now, you know, with this version, the translate uh, function um, is no longer has that error case, right? You now know, like, yes, I've handled all the cases. This is a safer way of handling it. Um, but you end up with a lot of duplication. And again, in practice, I find that there's usually some mix of these. You might have an outer AST, which has tons of components, and an inner AST that has eliminated a lot of them. Um, but you don't kind of do too much in between that to, um, to eliminate, you know, to uh, duplicate your AST many, many times. Um, so, uh, there is sort of a refinement of the micropass called nanopass. Um, I, until my current company, uh, where we use it, I haven't run into this in the wild other than, you know, other than education. Uh, it's used, um, Racket, I think, kind of um, uh, introduced this approach. And the nanopass idea is kind of a refinement of, of mi micropass where you try to fix those problems, get rid of the duplication, uh, and at the same time um, still have still maintain the safety um, of handling all the cases. And now, in a language like Racket, 
Uh, that's handled a lot with macros and, and things like that for you know, how you define your AST using macros. And, and, uh, and so it works well in that space. Um, with Scala, we'll take a, a different approach, basically. So the first thing is, uh, is fixed point types, um, where, uh, so who here is familiar with fix or anything like that? Rob, a couple, of, okay, good. Uh, okay, so a couple of people are. Uh, so, the, so the first thing we'll, we'll look at is we'll take our, our AST, and this is our simpler AST, right, that, um, that one that we, you know, after we've removed the, um, the let and the if. Uh, and so we've made it non-recursive. Right? So we basically turn up any recursive reference to the lambda uh, into a parameter. So now we have a, uh, a parameterized type, right? and all those recursive areas uh, are now A instead of, instead of inner lambda. Um, and so now, we have, now it's flat. We have this functor, basically. Um, how do we you know, get back to having uh, a recursive type? Um, and we'll, we'll see in a minute why this is beneficial. But for now, let's just look at you know, what, uh, how, how do we get back to what we had um, by making this change. Um, you know, you might think that like, oh, well, you have, I mean, the answer's at the bottom, but you can, uh, but the, the first thought is like, oh, I just have inner lambda of inner lambda, but that doesn't work because inner lambda is a, a functor itself, and so you need something, you could have actually, what you could do is you could do inner lambda of inner lambda of inner lambda of inner lambda, and eventually have like a unit at the end, and that would allow you to express things however many layers deep you, you defined, right? You could like, you could do inner lambda, inner lambda, inner lambda unit, and then have three level deep AST structures. That, that would work. Um, but this fixed point type is basically the Y combinator um, applied to types where you have this functor um, and in the value of that functor is fix of F and that fix contains a value of the functor which contains a fix of F and so you get this kind of uh, looping of it. There's other fixed point operators that are um, a little bit more uh, principled uh, but this is the simplest and uh, um, basically what this does, so by writing this type at the bottom, the, uh, the fixed inner lambda, you end up with a recursive data structure um, that is very similar to the, the one we had before that just directly referred to its, its um, subtypes or its, uh, itself. Um, so um, the first thing we're going to do with that is uh, use uh, coproduct and inject from cats. Now, since on the previous slide we just um, had the smaller lambda calculus version without the let and the if, we now actually define the let and the if also as functors, you know, with some a, um, but with their own case classes. They're not part of that lambda calculus anymore. They're just standalone types. Uh, and and um, we take advantage of, again, coproduct and inject from cats to, to let us do this. So what, what they do is basically let us compose these functors. Um, and that's what the... Uh, the colon plus colon is, uh, is basically composition, uh, or it's coproduct, but it's, it's these like, it gives you this composition of functors. So basically, that fix let colon plus colon f um, gives you a fixed point type where any of the, uh, uh, where you can either have a let or basically any of whatever's in f. Uh, so say f is lambda, um, which this, uh, this first part here, oh, good, you can see the cursor. Um, this first part here is saying that whatever f is, we don't care too much what it is. We just care that it has lambda in it. It could have other things as well. But we know that f is going to have that lam, app, and var uh, components in it. Right? And so, so assuming it just is lambda, on this side we're basically saying coproduct let and lambda together. So now we have a structure that says it's either a let or a lam, app, or var, any of those four components. Um, and we do it a fixed point version. So any of the recursive calls in there could be any of those four components. Um, so we basically just expanded that lambda by re-adding in the let uh, temporarily. And so this, now this very small pass, the only thing it does, instead of like desugaring, in our case, you know, just both let and if, this only does desugaring of the let part. Uh, and, and these are pretty generic what we're desugaring to. All we care about is that the result contains lambda. And so, you know, might contain other types as well, uh, and that the input uh, here contains some contains let as well. So that way, when we hit the case of a let, uh, we can expand it into things that are in the lambda, uh, the app and the lamb. Uh, this fix is the artifact of that fixed point type. We're basically saying like, oh, wrap this in that fixed point type. Wrap this in this fixed point type. Um, so now, um, 
So basically now we've, we've really decomposed this, right? We no longer even have a desugaring pass where we get rid of all of the stages of you know, our thing. We've now said, oh, just get rid of let. And then also down here, oh, it's got a little, a little small. Um, uh, also get rid of the, uh, sorry, that's not quite fitting on the screen. Um, also get rid of the, uh, the if, and there are two separate passes. Uh, and there should be a composition. Um, and now those two, those two functions can actually just be composed now, right? You can have a, uh, you can compose them anyway, either way, um, and you'll start with something. Uh, at the beginning of composition, you'll have some, say some um, some recursive structure that is a lambda plus lets plus ifs. Um, if you call expand let first, the let disappears, and then you call the expand if, and the if disappears, and now you've got just your lambda your, and your restricted version. So you know that there's no ifs, you know there's no lets. Uh, you can compose them the other way as well. Um, you know, you start with the same value, you eliminate the ifs and you have this, and then you eliminate the lets. Um, so this is just this flexible way of breaking these things down into kind of atomic pieces that you want to think about, and, uh, and then you know, basically um, making it possible without duplicating your structure to get these, these pieces all on their own, which lets you decompose even more than the original um, desugaring, because you don't kind of want to jump from one ST structure to another one. You just work on each atomic component uh, along the way. Um, but the, the problem with this is like you're, you've, um, you've basically, by, by destructuring all this stuff, by decomposing these things and then just putting them back together, every one of these steps is now a pass over your entire structure. So you end up like, oh, okay, well, let me go through the whole structure like removing let's. Okay, let me go through the whole structure removing ifs. Okay, let me do whatever, whatever, whatever. And you chain these large uh, operations uh, one after the other, which is fine. It's easy to understand, um, you know, great in an academic environment, but, uh, but it does not perform well. Um, so uh, there's a library, a new library, um, that I've uh, spent a lot of time on. Other people at Slam Data have also uh, worked on it. Um, and it's called, it's, it's just recently been created as a standalone project. It's been embedded in our code base for a while. Um, and it's called Matroshka, uh, which if you're familiar with the term, or not familiar with the term, is uh, Russian nesting dolls. So the idea is kind of controlled recursion or finite recursion. You have, you know, you have like five or six nesting dolls. You don't have some infinite set of them. Um, and, uh, and it's still in heavy development. I mean, uh, it works. We've been using it like crazy, um, but just kind of figuring out the use case or the, uh, the way to expose various parts of it to as a library and stuff. And uh, so 1.0 should be coming soon. Uh, we like getting out 1.0 and tracking our changes, you know, SEMVARs and stuff like that um, as early as possible. So we should have 1.0 out soon. I was hoping to have this submitted to uh, type level by now and have them say like, yeah, this is an incubator project. Uh, has not quite happened yet, but, uh, but from our side, we'd like it to be a type level thing. Uh, hopefully type level will see it as, as valuable as well. Um, so uh, that's what the next part of this is, is how to basically get back the performance we've lost by writing these nice decomposed things. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is, uh, is folds, unfolds, and transformations. This is kind of, the core of what uh, Matroshka is. Um, is anybody familiar, actually, um, does anybody know what Kata is? You've actually probably seen in Scala Z, or I don't know if Katz has a Kata as well. Um, but it's, uh, um, it's a fold, right? And this Kata is basically a, um, a generalization of fold write to any of these functor, any, any of these functor types, right? So any fixed point type like that. So you could actually define a list in this fixed point style as well, and kata is, is exactly fold right on that, uh, on that type. Um, so what, a kata, what kata does is it will um, take some fixed point recursive structure, right, and then take what's called an algebra um, that basically operates on one level of that structure, non-recursively. Um, and, uh, and apply that single transformation of that, of that algebra uh, across the whole structure uh, for you. So basically what it allows you to do is define, and we'll see, we'll see these algebras in just a second, but to define these kinds of, of functions that don't deal with recursion at all uh, and, and handle doing the recursion for you, um, which allows you to simplify your functions a lot. You don't have to worry about missing recursive cases or, um, or various other problems. It lets you write them a bit shorter. Um, and yeah, just there's it handles a lot of stuff for you, uh, but it, it separates these concerns basically. Uh, anamorphism is basically the uh, the dual of a catamorphism. It's an unfold, which is a less familiar concept to a lot of people. Uh, I, a very simple example I tend to think of is um, like prime factorization of a number. So you basically start with some 
you know, atomic value or whatever and can break it down. You basically unfold it, expand it into some set uh, of values. Um, a, you can kind of think of a parser like that. You start with some string, breaks it down. A uh, parser doesn't quite fit in this model, but in general, it's, it's basically unfolding that string structure into some recursive structure. So that, again, is the dual. You start with some value, and you unfold it into some recursive data structure. Uh, prime factoring is a simple example. Uh, this is like a, the other thing example here is a top-down type inference where you can kind of see if there's a little trick to unfold that you actually see a lot, which is starting with the recursive data structure in your, um, in your atomic value and like either modifying it or adding information to it along the way. Um, and then finally, there's this idea of a, of a transformation, um, which transformations match. There's basically a, a parallel transformation for any of these folds or unfolds. So there's a trans cata, which you see here, there's a trans ana. And those basically, um, rather than say folding or expanding, they basically translate one structure into another structure. Here you start with a, one recursive structure uh, and, and of, uh, oh, sorry, this, this T is the more generic type um, for these fixed point things that should actually be fix, uh, fix of G. So these, uh, and it was a T here. Um, that Matryoshka stuff generalizes over about five different fixed point types. So T is the, uh, the generalized form of that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so the trans cata um, basically is from one recursive structure to another one, which is something you do a ton in compilers. Uh, and actually, those could be, these transformations could be written, and there's operations to convert them to algebras, or uh, in the case of these unfolds, a co-algebra um, as well, whenever you need those. But, um, but often, it's more natural to write them in this kind of um, transformation style. Um, so here's some algebras of uh, algebraic versions of the things we've done. Before, so this expand let, which before we handled by recursively calling um, expand let itself on the expressions on the body. Um, now, when we get to this point, we actually um, can assume that that the body has already had expand let called on it, and that that body value no longer has lets in it. So we don't have to worry about those those things because these folds they work from the leaf nodes that have no children based no recursive children on them translate those those are your base cases and then since those have been translated uses those values in the previously recursive parts of the um, of the structure and then so you basically from this bottom up can translate so basically we don't have to recursively operate on body because the, the catamorphism um, has handled that for us. So in the algebra here, we say, oh, body is already free of lets. So we just take advantage of that um, and expand it here. And whereas before, actually, in the, um, um, in the micropass, or nano, even nanopass, in the nanopass case, you had to uh, handle all the different cases explicitly um, because you had to know, you, know, you had to call, uh, the you had to make the recursive calls in the right places. Um, here, we no longer need to do that. Anything that we don't need to transform, it's basically say, oh, it's already transformed. It's fine. Um, so we can just like, catch all, you know, this is this. Um, and there's a few other ways to write this where we actually don't ever even write the catch all part. Um, but again, so these are now our two things written algebraically, non recursively. And now, oops, now um, we can compose them just as we did before. You know, you can basically compose expand let and expand if. But this is different now because you're not composing. Um, you're not composing these full tree transformations. You're composing these algebras that only work on one level. So now you have a new algebra um, that does both these operations for you. And so you can see, so we use this trans cata call, which again applies this, um, this transformation over each thing. And so now with, one, with a, single, um, a single pass over our data structure, we apply both functions rather than doing we you know, do one pass expanding the lets and then a separate pass expanding the ifs. So we, we reduce the number of times that we need to, um, um, to traverse our data structure as we, as we make these changes. Um, so there's then other ways to combine um, different types of folds and unfolds and transformations uh, that, again, allow you to take advantage of, um, of this and, and reduce your passes over your data and compose these things at a reduced level. Um, one of them is what's called a hylomorphism, um, which basically just, just takes advantage of the fact that whenever you traverse a data structure, you have to go from the top down and then the bottom back up, right? So, you, so if you're doing a normal fold, you do all the work on the bottom up part of that, 
right? So you go, you traverse all the way to the bottom, and then you apply your function on the way back up. I guess I'm doing that backward. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, whereas with, a, um, with an anamorphism or an unfold, you're basically doing the work as you go to the bottom and then just rebuilding the structure or, or popping your way back out. And so what a hylomorphism does is it allows you to combine that unfold with a fold um, and do some operation on the way down and then the other operation on the way back up. And so you never end up building an intermediate structure. Um, so you, and, uh, and you do it all in one pass. So you've basically like now done these two things and, and gone back and forth. And you can decompose these things too. Like, you know, an anamorph or a hylomorphism, sorry, is just an anamorphism followed by a catamorphism. That is actually something we often do in debugging. We're like, what is going wrong in this stage? And you have all this stuff mashed together into one pass. And you can just kind of say like, I think something's here and basically separate um, you know, your things, wh wherever you feel like for debugging purposes, figure out which of your passes is messing up something, and then, like, you know, um, restore it to the nice composed version, efficient version um, afterward. Um, so that's one way to put things together. Another is uh, you have a couple independent transformations, say, uh, where you, um, you know, your pretty printer for your language or whatever, and then also your evaluator. Um, you can zip those two algebras, and in one pass, you get back a tuple of your strings and your. Um, uh, and your evaluation. Um, and so again, you've, you've saved this work by doing these independent things at the same time uh, in one traversal. Uh, and finally, you have, uh, I think this is finally, uh, you have um, these, this ability to annotate stuff. You do this a lot in compilers. You have to do type annotations or other you know, information that you need to carry around along with your stuff. Um, and, uh, and normally, you would basically track that explicitly. Like people might be familiar with Brian McKenna's talk or, or uh, blog post on um, bottom-up type annotation with Kofri. Um, so that's too complicated. Um, you can do a bottom-up uh, type inference that looks like this algebra where you don't ever you don't care about the Kofri, right? There's you just basically say like given some lambda node where I know the types of the parameters of the recursive parameters, I can give you back the type of um, of this param or of this node, right? So just given that, without having to keep track of that through the whole tree, uh, you now have the ability to um, take that simple algebra and apply the uh, the attribute operation to it, which turns it into a fold um, that maintains the structure and annotates it with the type at each node, right? So now you've only implemented this simple thing. Given you know for this one node, I have types, and I give you back the type of the node. Um, and it, now you can easily transform that into something that, that handles the annotation for you and gives you back this full structure. Uh, but again, you often don't want to, um, uh, to, to do that work. You, uh, or you, you, know, you don't want to waste time building up this intermediate structure. So what you can actually do, um, this should be called BU and for a type, but, uh, but if you have something else that's basically expecting you know, a type and some value and, uh, in your lambda, another fold, basically, but needs, some, you know, needs the type information in that fold, there's what's called a zygomorphism that basically performs effectively like this. You can think of it as, as this annotation, and it gives you that annotation on your second fold here. But it never builds up the code free. At each stage along the way, it first figures out the type and then just passes that type of that one node onto the next, um, your next fold. And so, again, you've, you've turned this into one pass. Um, eliminating the actual building up of this co-free structure along the way. Um, and uh, the opposite, uh, this is sort of a, a different way of composing things. Again, if you have like a top-down uh, type inference, which is actually uh, what we're using at Slam Data right now, um, there's this way of, uh, of, this is sort of like I mentioned with a hylomorphism where you go, you know, you do one operation on the way down and the other operation on the way back up. Um, but on this one, uh, this it's called a, a there's an LGOT, I think it's, I don't know how it's pronounced, LGOT algebra, or, um, and this is the, the dual of that. And so what this allows you to do is basically not only do one operation on the way down, but as you're doing that operation, carry some of that information onto um, the operation you're going to use on the way back up to the top. And so you, could use a, you can combine a, a top-down type inference uh, along with some other operation. Uh, so anyway, this, the, you know, the, the point here is that, that this library gives you um, uh, tons of ways to combine these things different, uh, you know, in different ways. Um, there's very generalized form. Basically, there's yeah, generalized things with uh, comanads and, and monads, and um, and there's just this, this great collection of them that allow you to kind of recompress your very discrete, you know, very um, decomposed set of um, easy to show that they're right 
uh, operations lets you turn them back into very small number of passes, get back a lot of the performance you lose uh, when you've left the, um, the monolithic style of, of writing a compiler. So uh, hopefully that's useful. A um, couple things with the questions. Uh, hopefully people can convince Rob to talk a bit about some Doobie-related fixed point stuff that he's been doing that I have not yet figured out how to take advantage of in Matryoshka, but um, I'm going to crack that nut. Um, I am happy to talk to people about this Matryoshka stuff I've been working on or slam data stuff or whatever. Um, Saturday's on conference. I probably won't be around much tomorrow, unfortunately, but, uh, but it will be on Friday and Saturday. Uh, so I might uh, maybe talk some more on, on conference if people are interested. Um, slam data, my company's hiring, so if any of this compilation stuff sounds interesting, it's a super FP company. We love type level stuff like crazy. Um, and uh, and um, if compiler stuff isn't interesting, if analytics or other stuff like that is interesting, uh, we're very remote friendly. And, uh, and we are looking to hire uh, at least one person, maybe more, I don't know. Um, and, then, uh, and then there's Lambda Conf coming up in May with uh, another uh, type level uh, summit the day before, at the, the day leading up to Lambda Conf, uh, that's in Boulder, Colorado. Again, end of May, Memorial Day weekend. Um, and yeah, so, anything else? <laughs>